Um, welcome back, everyone, to the last uh, section of the It's Kids on Conference. Um, I will give the word to the, our chair, Jorge Kurcha, who will introduce the speaker. Okay, so we start the evening session uh, with Steven Schenker, Wormholes Without Averaging. So if you have questions during the talk, send me the uh, chat. Okay, so well, let me share my screen. Whoops. There we are. Well, I, I'm happy to be here uh, at this conference. I want to thank the organizers for doing so much work. Uh, the, this kind of conference that tries to bridge uh, barriers between subfields is very valuable. And, and I, I've enjoyed the talks I've been able to listen to. Uh, I knew Claude uh, when I was a young physicist starting out, and I learned a lot from him and from others in the French school at that time. And so I'm, I'm especially glad to be here at a conference named in his honor. Uh, my recent uh, reunion with random matrix theory has made me appreciate again uh, his central contributions to that subject, among, among others. But one of the instructions that we as speakers received from the organizers, a good instruction, was to try to make our talks accessible to people in other subfields. And uh, I, because we don't have a lot of time, I, I had to make a choice. And I've, I've chosen to concentrate more on viewpoint and motivation rather than on technical details. And I'll, I'll talk about a few technical details, but I, I would like to try to convey uh, what motivates us to think about the subjects that have, are of common interest in this uh, um, subject. So the concrete work that I'll describe uh, is contained in a new preprint and my collaborators in that work are Phil Saad, who is uh, now a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study, Douglas Stanford, who many of you know, is a faculty member at Stanford, and Shun Yu Yao, who's a graduate student at Stanford. And so as, as an introduction, uh, I work now in quantum gravity and the central uh, kind of arena that most of us that study the subject uh, work in is uh, what's called gauge gravity duality. And this is uh, the canonical example of this, sometimes called ADS-CFT. In that situation, one has a quantum mechanical system, an ordinary, in this case, a quantum field theory, the super Yang Mills theory in three plus one space time dimensions. And the claim of this duality is that this is precisely the same thing. It maps under a duality to a certain quantum gravity theory, really a string theory in a space that's uh, five space time dimensional with a compact space tensor dot. And there's substantial evidence that this mapping between the two is really a precise map. All kinds of very remarkable things line up. But that being said, this is uh, the, the, the statement is in, of necessity incomplete because we don't know all the rules for the bulk quantum gravity theory. We don't know non perturbatively what this means. And maybe said more poetically, what is the gravitational path integral? You'd have to have strings and brains and so on. Or even more poetically, what is quantum gravity? We don't know the answers to these questions. And so it's hard to know whether this is a precise mapping or not. Uh, and part of what we want to do is use the information about uh, the subject. After all, among other things, this is a kind of special theory, but it is a chaotic many body system. And some of the things being talked about today will cast some light on behaviors that this system must have. Just to, for a future reference, I have to say that this theory on the boundary, this quantum mechanical system, there's no hint that this belongs to an ensemble. This is an essentially unique theory. And uh, there's one of them. Now, just to illustrate our ignorance, there's a, there's a basic puzzle called a, the factorization puzzle that Maldacena and Mao has pointed out. Um, in this ADS-CFT context, imagine that you have two decoupled systems, let's say two copies of super Yang mills called left and right. 
and compute the partition function, the thermal partition function of the combined system. Obviously, from the quantum perspective, uh, you, what it means to have decoupled quantum systems is the partition function of the combined system is the product of the partition functions of the individual systems. Here's a Euclidean thermal circle, here's that. The combined system has the same picture, so it's the same thing. But if you try to compute this from the gravitational perspective, well, we don't know what that means. A popular set of rules is you take the boundaries and you fill them in with whatever geometries can fit between these two boundaries. Also, here's a geometry in one space, one time, a kind of disk. So it looks like a Euclidean black hole. And here's another one. But there's another geometry that can fit this kind of wormhole. It's called a space time wormhole because that's time. And this thing sort of naturally breaks this factorization because this links left and right. Now, in the simple models we know about, these things are big. They're weighted by e to the Euler character times the entropy. So this is e to the s, this is e to the s. And this thing has Euler character zero, so this is weighted by one. So this is a small violation of factorization, but it's leading. It's the first violation of this. And these leading things are easy to isolate, and so one has to deal with them. Now, you know, maybe 10 years ago when this problem emerged or before then, I might have said, and many people said, well, there might be some rule that you don't include wormholes in the gravitational path integral. You know, maybe they're unstable, maybe they're, they don't lie on the integration contour, some reason like that. Uh, I probably would have subscribed to something like that. But what's changed is it's turning out that these wormholes are very useful. And there's a number of recent applications. The one we'll focus on is they seem to describe the ramp behavior in the spectral form factor, which we'll regard as the analytically continued partition functions. Now, and there's replica wormholes and things. But in certain applications, like the spectral form factor, the left and the right system are just decoupled. It's the product of partition functions. And so the wormhole explanation for this ramp behavior raises a factorization puzzle. So we have to deal with it if we want to accept this, this uh, explanation. Now, the real control calculations that we've done saying that the wormhole causes this ramp have been done in simple models described by ensembles of these boundary quantum systems. The SYK model we've heard a lot about and it's low energy limit to keep tidal buoy gravity, which is dual to some random matrix ensemble. Now, in an ensemble of quantum systems, if the brackets denote ensemble averaging, the ensemble average of a combined system doesn't have to be equal to the product of the averages. So there's no factorization puzzle. And in fact, this link between ensembles and wormholes has a long history. It goes back to the work of uh, Sidney Coleman and Giddings and Strominger in the 80s. But even in this kind of simple ensemble world, we can state a version of the factorization puzzle. What happens if we just look at one element of the ensemble? Now, as a basic result that you should keep in mind, that if you're in some regime of parameters where wormholes give the dominant answer, like the factorization question or the ramp in the spectral form factor, then the variance of that quantity is of order the signal squared. Well, you see that? Well, let's compute the variance. You have two copies of the system. Here's two left rights, left right, left right. And draw geometries. Well, here's the signal squared. But there's another way to draw the wormholes this way and this way, kind of like wick contractions. And so there's three things that obviously by permutation symmetry have the same weight. So this thing is three times the signal squared. That means the variance. Is, is big, it's a border of the signal squared. So the answer depends sensitively on which element of the ensemble you choose, it's noisy. And so another part of this puzzle is what accounts for the noise? Well, here's uh, concretely, let's imagine we take this SYK ensemble, uh, you have J's coupling fermions. And here's a picture of the spectral form factor. Well, you see, first of all, this is a log log scale. So this is big and this is small. This ramp feature that we've heard about 
it's a small thing. It's exponentially smaller than this early time thing, which actually is described by these disks. And it's noisy. This red curve corresponds to just taking one representative of the SYK ensemble, whereas the blue curve is its average. This noisiness of the spectral form factor was explained in this uh, very important early paper by Prangy in the 90s, titled The Spectral Form Factor is Not self averaging One element of the ensemble doesn't look like the average. Now, it turns out when you think about it, this autocorrelation time uh, is short. And so you can isolate what looks like the smooth signal by doing time averaging. It acts kind of like ensemble averaging, and it accentuates the smooth ramp, which we think is explained by wormholes. This suggests, just suggests that in the uh, um, single uh, sample case, wormholes might play a role. That doesn't have to be the case, but it suggests one should explore that possibility. The other thing, and one of the things we, we take from the kinds of ideas being discussed in this conference, is that even though this is, is a curve from uh, this very simple model, the SYK model, random matrix universality, that is, uh, Super Yang Mills is a quantum chaotic system. Its energy levels should obey random matrix universality at fine enough energy scales. That should imply that the shape of this red curve should uh, be the behavior of super Yang Mills theory. Super Yang Mills theory is going to look like this too. So if you have this duality between super Yang Mills theory and some kind of string theory, it better account for this noise. So this is a question. What accounts for the noise in the bulk description? Now this noise is aboard of the signal. This is a log-log plot. So a constant uh, uh, size spread is like a, a a noise proportional to the size of the signal. So that's at the right size to play a role in restoring factorization. And in fact, part of the story I'll tell is we think what accounts for this noise is exactly what you need to uh, restore factorization. So now we're going to try to examine this question, not in super Yang Mills theory. We don't have the tools for that, but in one element of the SYK ensemble. We'll take this SYK model, fermion quantum mechanics with random couplings, and choose a single fixed choice of the couplings and see if we can analyze it. Now, in particular, we'll, we'll use the description of the SYK model that actually Subir reviewed for us, this collective field description that helps make the contact between this model and gravity. So let me talk about collective fields in the SYK model. Well, in SYK, it's standard to construct path integrals for average quantities in terms of these collective fields. And it turns out these collective fields, usually called G and sigma, are proxies for the bulk variables, the gravity variables. If we have just one partition function, I'll call it left. It has what we might call just left, left, and right, and left, left uh, collective fields. They represent the correlation within the single L system. So we write GLL is the product of a left fermion at T times a left fermion at T prime. And the rule at low energies where this thing is supposed to look like JT gravity is if you're taking its value, you, uh, you find a saddle point, a thermal saddle point might look, let's say like this Euclidean black hole, and you compute the correlation function of a fermion operator in the bulk on this geometry. And that gives you the answer for this collective field. So in some sense, these collective fields are a different language to describe geometry. You describe this geometry in terms of the correlators on it. Now, this model is extremely oversimplified. We don't understand some of the extra stuff that's in it. But what's good about it is we have an explicit representation for this toy gravitational path integral. We know the weighting factor and in the integration space for G and sigma. So we can explore the nooks and crannies in this path integral and find out what's hiding there. Now, what are wormholes? If you have left and right systems, you have left, left, right, right, and left, right collected fields. So here will be a wormhole geometry. This is the kind of thing that explains the ramp. And it involves a fermion on the left coupled to a fermion on the right. 
And if you have a non-zero expectation value of that, it means that this saddle point in gravity is important. Now, there's no problem in having such a solution because um, there's the same randomness applies to the left and the right system, so they're correlated. And so with explicit correlations, there's no factorization problem. Now, we'll be able to write a collective field integral for z left times z right, including the left right fields, for fixed couplings. And then we'll try to ask what happens to the wormholes. If they remain, how does this product factorize as it must if you just have fixed couplings? Now, it turns out actually the SYK toy model is too hard for us. So we had to make a toy model of the toy model. And it turns out the model we were able to analyze in detail is when we consider the quantum mechanics model at one time point. So we replace, let's say, the Grassmann field psi, psi of t. That's what you use to formulate a path integral for the SYK quantum mechanics by psi sub i at one value. So you replace this field by a number, a Grassmann number. And so we're dealing not with path integrals, but ordinary integrals over Grassmann's. And the collective fields will be ordinary low dimensional integrals. Now, in case I, I run out of time, let me just say what we find. We find that these wormhole saddles persist even with fixed couplings and that their weight, their action depends only weakly on the choice of couplings. But there are new saddle points with actions that depend strongly on the choice of couplings, which we'll call half wormhole saddles. I'm not gonna be able to motivate that here. I don't have the time. Now, when you add these contributions and these contributions that gives the full answer and it factorizes. Now we expect we can make a plausible scenario, but we can't really prove that the same story holds in the full SYK model. And I'm afraid I won't have time to, to elaborate on that, but uh, in the paper, we, we give a scenario where we think how we think that works. Well, let's talk about this SYK model with one time point. Well, here's the partition function. It's the integral over n Grassmann variables. These, it's, you have, this Q is usually four. It's the number of fermions. That's a product of four size. And this is J with four indices. These Js are chosen uh, Gaussian random distributed. And this is just an ordinary n-dimensional Grassmann integral with, over n Grassmann fields. We can then take two copies, often called replicas, Z left, Z right. We have n left-hand, uh, Grassmann numbers and right Grassmann numbers. And then we use the same randomness, random couplings for the left Grassmanns. This is a product of four size, say, and the right product of four size. And this is just some finite dimensional Grassmann integral. You can expand it out and do it if you were strong enough. Well, to warm up, let's calculate the ensemble averages of these and find the analog of wormhole saddle points. It turns out the expectation value of just one partition function is zero. That's easy to see. And that's related to the fact that one copy has no interest in collective fields since G left left, that's psi left, psi left. This is just the product of Grassmann numbers. This is equal to zero. So there's no disk in this toy model. That's okay, because we're interested in the wormhole. There's still a wormhole. So we can write the expectation value of Z left, Z right. And we can write a G sigma integral for this quantity. That's what the fermion expression. You average over J's, do the Gaussian integral. If this is product of four size, you get products of eight size. The psi left, psi left thing vanishes because Grassmann squared is zero. So you get psi left, psi right to the fourth. Now you introduce collective fields along the lines that Subir discussed, uh, I guess, yesterday. So we insert a factor of one saying that G left right is the same as psi left psi right. And then of course this factor is trivial. And if you put this one into this, this Grassmann term cancels with this term. And so you're just up with capital G to the Q and the Delta function. Then you write this Delta function as a, with a Lagrange multiplier field, integrate sigma over the imaginary axis. 
And this is a delta function that G is equal to psi left, psi right. Then the Grassmann numbers just appear quadratically, so you can integrate them out. In general, you get a Fafian of this, but this is just a number, so you just get uh, the Fafian is just sigma, and you have m fermions, so you have the sigma to the n. And that's all you get. Now, it turns out this integral is only conditionally convergent because of the oscillating uh, delta stuff in the delta function integral. So if you rotate sigma and g, the contours, you can make the integral uh, uniformly convergent. And so it's easier to deal with. So we introduce little sigma and little g, and I'll suppress the left-right indices. But remember that these are left-right variables. And so now we have an explicit expression for this. This is uh, sigma to the nth put in the exponent. This is g to the fourth, and this is the cross term. And this is the part that came from Grassmann's, and we'll lump it together and call it capital phi of sigma. This is this Grassmann phi into the n. And then the entire integral is now a two-dimensional integral over sigma and g. This piece, we can do the g integral. This is just some known function. This is like an airy function. And we'll call that capital psi. And we've reduced this quantum gravity integral to a one-dimensional integral over these two known things. Now, at large n, we can look for saddle points. Um, and the saddle point equations look like this. In particular, this is in the original variables. The qth roots of unity are all saddle points. Uh, and these saddle points are wormholes because g left right is psi left times psi right. If this has a non-trivial VEV, it means there's strong correlations between left and right. And again, the correlation is reasonable because we're averaging over the same randomness in left and right, they're correlated. And in particular, the saddle point, you can represent it by a picture like that. It's the analog of this kind of wormhole saddle in the full model. Well, that's the, just warm up. We now want to write a G sigma integral if the J's are fixed and we don't rent, integrate over them. So we, again, we introduce this factor of one, we put in a sigma to represent the delta function. And then we, and then we integrate out the Grassmann numbers. But now the Grassmann numbers are more complicated. This is the Grassmann piece. And you have this psi psi times sigma. And if you integrated out j here, you'd get this psi left times psi right to the fourth that would cancel that. If you don't integrate over j, this is some complicated j-dependent function if you do this Grassmann integrals. They're hard to do, but it's a completely well-defined expression. Some big polynomial if n is finite. Again, if you integrate out the j's, you just are left with this that gives this Fafian to the nth piece. Here we have some complicated J-dependent thing that contains all the information about the fixed couplings. So then we can write this as an integral over this explicit function that we call psi, this generalization of the area function, and this complicated J-dependent thing that you, you, know, you could evaluate numerically if you had to. This thing that I've called like a generalized area function decays rapidly along the axis, real axis. And this phi is like a black box that includes all the microscopic information. Now, you could compute it numerically. It turns out it's kind of hard for Q greater than two. For Q equals two, we can do it. But we can study its statistical properties for typical J configuration and ask, when does this fluctuate a lot? For what sigmas does it fluctuate a lot? And the question we're interested in is what happens when we go from this explicit integral, when we replace phi of sigma with j dependence to the average? The average just has this nice wormhole saddle. This phi without averaging has all this noise. What does that do to things? Do these wormhole saddles survive the noise? We know this thing has to be noisy by this general argument for uh, fluctuations and wormhole quantities. Where in the sigma integral does that noise come from? Well, the key to that is to study 
this function phi of sigma. And we can study this by computing the second moment phi of sigma squared and comparing it to the average squared. If the ratio is close to one, then it means this is self-averaging. And the contribution at this value of sigma is uh, given by the average value squared. If this is much larger than this, it means the fluctuations are big. And that sigma region is non-self-averaging. The contribution of that part of the integral will depend sensitively on the choice of j. Now, how do you compute the second moment? Well, you introduce an auxiliary system, we'll call it L prime R prime. You write collective fields for this average and you get sigma LL prime, sigma RR prime. In addition to these things, you're fixing. And then you can look for saddle points in this averaged quantity. And that gives you a way of evaluating the second moment. Or you can actually write an exact expression for this average because it's a simple enough thing. But in any event, we can control this and we can control that. And then we can make a plot. And the plot is this. We compare the second moment to the mean squared. This is the complex sigma plane. And we find these are the four roots of unity. Here's Q equals four. These are the wormhole sounds. And this blue scallop curve is the, the demarks the, 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 the boundary of the region between self-averaging, small fluctuations, and non-self-averaging. Sigma values inside the scallop region are not self-averaging. Sigma values outside are self-averaging. So the wormhole saddles are self-averaging. Choosing one J gives essentially the same contribution to the wormhole saddles as uh, averaging. But remember, we have to integrate sigma all along, let's say, the real axis. So there's parts of that integral that enter the non-self-averaging region. And those are the places where the noise must come from. And then we can ask along this kind of integral, uh, which regions contribute the most noise? Now, it turns out it's, when you think about the integral, it's easiest to think about doing the integral along rays that go through these wormhole saddles. These are like steepest descents contours. And so we can plot. This is sigma along that 45 degree ray. And we take the root mean square of this quantity. That's something that says how big uh, the fluctuations are. And we can look at the integrand with the root mean square here and see where uh, the integral for a typical J configuration has a big contribution. So we imagine integrating this. And we treat this thing, we write it as e to some action by taking the log of this, dividing by n and plotting it. So this is sigma, and this is this action. The biggest values up here are the places that make the largest contribution at large n. Things that are lower are exponentially suppressed at large n. This is the wormhole cell. Again, we're going along this 45 degree ray. That's that place. And as we go in toward the origin, we find that there's another place whose magnitude is the same size. And so contributes just as much as this. That's this region at the origin. So there's a new saddle point whose value depends sensitively on what J's you have. And we call that new saddle point the half wormhole. Again, I can't explain the words, but just there's a new saddle point you don't have to worry about the whole integral at large n because these things are exponentially suppressed. Now, suppose you averaged phi. And so you replace this by the average of phi. That gives this red curve. And you can see that this action is large negative. This makes a very tiny contribution at sigma equals zero. That's basically because the integrand goes like sigma to the n and that vanishes at sigma equals zero. So the average contribution only has a contribution for the wormhole. 
The non-average contribution has a contribution here that depends on the joint J choice and a contribution that doesn't depend on the J choice very much. You say the half wormhole contribution vanishes after average. And so the summary of this story is the following. The wormhole saddles persist with fixed couplings. Their weight is only weakly dependent on the choice of J's. They're self-averaging. But there's this new saddle point, the half wormhole, whose weight strongly depends on the choice of J's. It gives the noise. When you add up these two contributions, you get an accurate calculation of this thing when it's not averaged using these collective fields at large end. Now, of necessity, this must agree with a manifestly factorized answer, where if you could evaluate, let's say, one copy numerically and square it, you'd have to get the answer that's the sum of these two saddles. In Q equals two, we can verify that something like this happens. Q equals four, it's hard to do the numerics. And if we average this now, we'll find that this half wormhole contribution vanishes. And all that's left is the non-factorizing wormhole saddle. And it doesn't factorize, but it doesn't have to because you're average. Well, I'm at the end of my time. And so let me just close by not uh, elaborating. Let me just close by the central question that this kind of a uh, toy model of the toy model raises. And that question is, do the structures described here, this new saddles, have any analog in more standard holographic theories, like the super Yang Mills uh, type 2B string theory correspondence? If so, some of these structures must be sensitive to the microscopic, microscopic dynamics to represent the noise. And there's a big program in uh, string theory, uh, often called the fuzzball program, trying to understand. Uh, the bulk version of microstates, the individual microstates. These would know about the noise. Could these contributions have anything to do with fuzzballs? Well, we don't know. There's, there's ways in which it's different. Maybe I should close by advertising at yet another Sackley conference, which is next week, which is about black hole microstructure, where these kinds of ideas will be discussed. So at that point, let me just stop there and take any questions. Thank, thanks a lot for giving me a chance to tell you this. Thank you, Stephen. So um, questions? Adrian Sanchez Garrido, speak up. Adrian? OK, hello. Adri um so I was just wondering if there's a reason to expect uh, a priori that factorization should be restored already at the level of the saddle point analysis. No, no, it, it could. Uh, in fact, I think uh, if I were guessing, I would figure that you had that you had to integrate in a wild way. You'd have contributions all across the gravity path integral. Mm -hmm. You know, and in fact, if you don't do it cleverly, you'll find that's the case. You know, you'll. You have to choose the steepest descent contour to get saddle point, but it turns out in this model that uh, the this, the noise is localized at certain configurations. Mm -hmm. And, and that, in this, mm -hmm. yes, that didn't we didn't, didn't have to be. Okay, so th this might be a particularity of this uh, model, or it could be. It could mm -hmm. be. We think it works in full SYK, but uh, yeah, that's that. It could be that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Elias. Um, hi, Steve. Thank you very, hi. very much for a very um, interesting talk. I have two questions. The first okay. one is uh, concerning your half wormholes. Yeah. I presume the way you describe them, they're saddle points, they're therefore semi classical states, but they're supposed to describe a region where the fluctuations are very large. How the two are sort of compatible? It's because the, the weighting factor uh, in this particular model, the weighting factor depends, by, by noise, I mean, it depends on this particular choice of microscopic Hamiltonian. For a given choice, the answer is, is fixed. Uh, and and there's, not, there's not noise there. So you mean that if I choose another J, 
I will get a very different, but still saddle, which is a half wormhole. You'll get, you'll get a saddle at the same value of sigma, but its weight will be different. I see. Okay. And, that, and, and that's the way it works. Okay. Thank now, you. now I, let, I, I'll add to that. Uh, this, is, this is sort of deeply unsatisfactory. What you really want is you want some bulk machinery that produces this noise. You want some chaotic dynamics or something, you know, strings or brains or something that, you know, here we basically have to put everything into this black box. Uh, but you might imagine that this is some kind of effective description for some unknown chaotic bulk dynamics. We just don't know how it works. Do you mean that the bulk system does cannot describe this dynamics? Or because you're using a very simplified system, you cannot do it. I mean the second. I see. I mean the second. It could it could well be. I mean, I think our hope is that in you know whatever quantum gravity or the non-perturbative definition of type two B string theory is, that there is there are objects that uh, you know wheel around, and it's their dynamics that gives this noise, this these subtle you know time dependence and so on. I see. I have another question, which I'm not sure if I understood exactly your statement. When you consider a left yeah. and a right system, now these systems yeah. have individual fermions, or if you wish, if they were super Yagmins, there will be the elementary quarks, etc. cetera, um, yes. uh, joint quarks. Now, normally we make uh, single trace or gauge invariant combinations from one system and from the other system, and these are the ones we use. But you are yeah. advocating that we should make also gauge invariant combinations where we use one, let's say, quark, quote unquote, from one side and one from the other. Is this what you mean, or did I misunderstand? That's that's the way it works in the SYK model. Now the question is whether or not uh, that is the right way to understand bulk fields in in uh, super Yang mills. We just don't know the answer. I, I um, that that's that's a really good question. Whether you need to have in the bulk some analog of g left right. But you see, if you if you consider super young mills, then the yes. two the two the, the two theories have two different gauge invariances. So yes. in principle, if you consider, I agree, this is not the case with SYK. But yeah. in super young mills, you have a gauge invariance, and therefore yes. these sort of mixed fields they will not be gauge invariant. Yes. So, but again, I think probably the analog would somehow have to be that you don't think about the quarks. You think about some singlet fields, but you know there are very complicated, sing like black hole microstate fields or something that are correlated <laughs> left and right. You know, yes. not things that are nominally, as you know, you know, high in high energy states like black holes or high temperature states, gauge invariance is kind of irrelevant. I mean, roughly speaking, a high temperature Yang-Mills theory looks like deconfined quarks. That's true. And so you might imagine whatever the gauge invariant operator is that describes a deconfined quark or gluon, it's that that times the one on the, on the left times the one on the right. Right, but then you're not talking about fields yes. because usually when we talk about fields, that would be, uh, you know, usually we describe simple states. Anyway, they don't want to, yeah, let's give a little time for Bernard Julia and okay. We have a few minutes left. Yeah, yes. Uh, Bernard, you. go ahead. Yes, uh, so my question is, uh, you uh, regretted you found bad that factorization was lost. But in the case of uh, baby young males, isn't that true that theta vacua are just what you need to restore factorization? So in other words, in your case, you would have to choose the uh, state in the ensemble or is another ensemble so that factorization holds? Yes, the question is, how does that work? I mean, what, what does it mean in gravity for that to be the case? Yeah, I understand. I mean, that, that yes, I think, I think that's, that's correct, that uh, uh, in terms of the boundary field theory, you'll have to do something like that. But the, but the, the, the question is, how does gravity uh, you know, figure that out. In particular, if you allow these wormhole gravitational configurations, uh, you know, what happens to them? What cancels them? And uh, that, that's, that's the puzzle. Thank you. Uh, Andrea? 
Yeah, hi Steve. Um, so in your toy model, hi, the toy model, um, the yeah. half wormhole, but also I think the the wormhole uh, don't really have a geometric uh, description, right? Because the the dual of SYK is not really Einstein gravity. It's has some strange features. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm afraid that's correct. Yeah. Do, do you ever uh, expect these half wormholes to become geometric in some maybe some higher dimensional? Um, I wish I knew that that's mm -hmm. that, of course, is the most important question. And then uh, uh, second. Yeah, sorry. I should say that, you know, we we've looked at some other models that are more geometrical, these low dimensional models like JT gravity and random matrix ensembles and uh, this Marolf Maxfield model and we, we build a kind of effective descriptions where you get something like these half wormholes. Uh, so there's there are hints that something like this is going on, but we really don't understand. In particular, and, is a half wormhole really half of a wormhole geometrically? Uh, so that that's an open question. I'm and afraid. is there a sense in which you uh, can describe can say that some? Uh, I mean, you have different uh, half wormholes for different uh, values of j. But is there a yeah. sense to say that there are some that are typical and some that are more atypical, which is what you would do if you have like states and your you know, average over states, there are some that are more typical uh, and some that are not? Or is everybody typical here because? Well, no, not everything is, not everybody is typical. Uh, I mean, in this language, what typicality means is, you know, you choose these J's from the ensemble. You can choose a really weird collection of J's that won't act like this. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we've computed things statistically. So we're saying for, for J's that have a large weight in the J ensemble, this is the way things work. Mm -hmm. So we have injected typicality into this. Hey, Igor, very quick question. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, I'm wondering if this uh, zero dimensional model is rather special because there are no quadratic terms at all. Because I, it looks like these wormholes just in the average z squared come in at leading order, right? Like your very leading order mm -hmm. subtle mm -hmm. point has uh, mm -hmm. th this uh, left, right, g left, right. But for example, if you look at just uh, the models with quadratic terms, I don't think that will be the case. Uh, for example, you if you look, uh, I don't know if you heard my talk earlier today, but- I'm afraid I didn't, Igor, it was a little early for me. Right, right, no offense. <laughs> but uh, well, if you, look, if you look at that, literally the model I talked about with alpha equals zero, that's basically just the uh, two copies of uh, with the same J I J K L. Is it? A, it's quantum mechanics, or is, yeah, it's yeah, quantum, quantum mechanics. Again? But but I don't. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. I think so. In that case, definitely the leading saddle point will not have G left right non vanishing. Yeah, yeah. They're they're so so in full S Y K. What what we would say is go to long time. We we found like in the average. SYK model, as you know, a wormhole saddle point. Mm -hmm. It's subleading compared to the disk at short times, but right. at long times it dominates. Mm -hmm. okay. And so we just imagine take full SYK, go to long enough times past the thallus mm -hmm. time. And then you're in the situation where wormholes effectively dominate. Mm -hmm. And we think, you know, we can build a scenario where the same story happens in SYK. What we can't do is explore the full functional integral and argue, oh, there are some other crazy saddle points that screw up this story. In this toy of the toy, we can, you know, examine the integral, mm -hmm. you know, completely and figure out that there's nothing else there. Mm -hmm. So, but we think there's a scenario where something like this works in full SYK. So, so the way you get around the, the disk is you, you, again, you have to, you have to, one of the good things is, is uh, by looking at things like the spectral form factor, you can isolate the wormhole. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. if there are no more questions, let's thank again, Stephen. Okay. Well,